to your worship service here at New Light Church in Deland, Florida. We're happy and glad to have you join. Thank you for your continued uh, support uh, through your prayers and through your offerings. If you live in the surrounding area, uh, we would invite you to come and worship with us in person. I uh, also would like to remind you that a part of our offerings that we give uh, back uh, from, from our church is we give to uh, Folds of Honor, or I should say you give, uh, which is educating the children of our fallen heroes. Uh, we also, you also give to Tunnel Two Towers, uh, which is creating homes for disabled uh, heroes. and you also give to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So thank you for that and God bless your giving. Happy Father's Day to all of those fathers and we hope that today will be a, a good day and a fun day on this uh, wonderful day of celebrating our fathers. Now let us continue in our service with the singing of our Father's praise. Let's lift our voices together. We're going to have to sing extra loud this morning to fill this space with our voices as we celebrate Father's Day and our Father's up above love for all of us. <laughs>
Amen. Let's turn on our hymnals to 621. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. 621. <laughs> Watching us closely during that hymn, you will notice that toward the end you will see Fawn shake her head. And that is my sign to come up to the front. I'm well, used to that sign online. because. They can't see it online, Richard, because they're seeing the words online, so they won't see. <laughs> oh, okay. Everyone here knows. <laughs> now you've just let go back. <laughs> well, I guess I don't need to finish what I was about to say. <laughs> what I was about to say was that for those of you that are watching our praise team toward the end of the hymn, you will notice that Fawn shakes her head. That means it is my time to come up front. And I'm used to that sign because she does the same thing at home. <laughs> Shakes her head, it's time for me to fix supper. I do not shake Shakes her head, it's, just, it's time for me to clean the house. Lord, forgive him. <laughs> now the truth comes out. <laughs> I forgot to turn my light on. <laughs> wonder why I couldn't see. Oh, you know, if you can't be happy and be a Christian, you... You're in a mess. You're in a real mess. We, in a time of talking to our Heavenly Father, the Father of all of us, 
who started this thing called humanity. And uh, personally today, uh, I give thanks to my Heavenly Father for giving me life, for giving me more blessings in this life than I could ever count, and most of all, for giving me the opportunity to believe in Him, His Son, and His Spirit, and the opportunity and the privilege to follow Him, and the result of that, He promises that I will live forever in the kingdom of heaven. And I cannot say that without smiling because it makes me happy. We uh, want to remember uh, Mark in New York who is recovering from some surgery. Also his brother Gary, I think, is still recovering. Uh, Ginger continues to recover. We have a lot of people recovering, don't we? We ought to call the first be called the first church of recovery. And, and I guess that's that's true. We are recovering from our sin. And uh, anyway, that's a sermon. I want to lift up Richard and Bill and uh, Mary, who we just discovered this week, who listens to us from Ocala. Is uh, We have a couple people listening to us from Ocala. Uh, Mary is uh, 90... 95 and uh, she uh, writes to us uh, regularly and uh, we appreciate that Mary and she says that she's getting better from uh, she went through a bout of COVID and uh, had some respiratory problems uh, along with many other people so we uh, thank uh, her and uh, thank all of you that are in the process of praying for those that are in recovery. Do we have anybody else that we would like to lift up? If not, then in preparation for our time of talking with our Heavenly Father, uh, Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104. Oh, how I love thy law, it is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, our gracious Heavenly Father, and without being funny or humorous or sacrilegious, we do wish you a happy Father's Day. Thank you for being our Father, and thank you for being our Dad. Thank you for leading us and showing us the way of righteousness. For without you, our souls, our bodies, and our lives would be condemned. We thank you for sending your Son, making the ultimate sacrifice, that if we believe that that blood spilled, on the foot of the cross. We believe that that is the atonement and the expiation of our sin. We can go to heaven. Father, we do believe in you are our righteousness. 
we believe that in our belief there will be a resurrection as you gave us an example through your son father you have become real to us through your holy spirit being our guide and being our comforter thank you for adopting us making us joint heirs in your kingdom it has been and it continues to be your law that gives us wisdom truth and discernment for you are our comfort our salvation our peace and our assurance this day we do lift up those that are lonely those that are ill those that are in prison those that are taking care of those that we just prayed for we pray for all of the churches throughout the world that continue to lift up the cross of salvation and those pastors who are brave and willing to preach your word in this world of evilness for it is in your name your son's name and your spirit's name that we do pray that prayer that your son taught us how to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever Thank you.
Shake your head so I didn't know what time it was. Come up. Sorry. I'm reminded, honey, of the scripture in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. It says, Wives, submit yourself <laughs> unto your husbands. Finish it, goes on, finish it. it goes, well, it goes on to say, and do not interrupt him. Oh, <laughs> that's for me. That's <laughs> well, I gotta be, I gotta be honest. That that verse does have more to it, yes. and it says, "Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands," basically, in saying, "As your husbands submit themselves unto the Lord." There we go. Does that make you happy? Yes. And shake Very your head. Yes. Happy. Very so there is a requirement for wives to submit themselves to their husbands. Their husbands must be following Christ. And if their husbands are following Christ, their wives will be treated as queens. Okay? Aren't you Amen. treated aren't you treated as a queen? Yes, dear. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> It seems to me that we have never experienced such divisions, such divisiveness, such revengeful attitudes, hate, anger, and a lot of confusion in this country and over the laws of the land. There seems to be so much precedence law that reading the founders writings and documents of our nation and then watching the news or reading the newspaper bear little resemblance. Precedence law I will explain to you in very simple terms what precedence law is. If you're a carpenter or have ever fooled around with wood, if you're going to make a picket fence, you make a template that is a pattern. And you lay that pattern down on a piece of wood, you cut out the picket, and then you take that same template and cut out another one. And when you finish, every picket in that picket fence will look like that original template, that pattern, that form. However, I have seen some people take and make a picket, and then they will, for a copy, use the last picket they made. And then after that, every picket will be from the afore picket. And I got news for you, when you get finished and look at that picket fence, it will not resemble a picket fence. You don't understand that one? Let me give you another one. <laughs> Have you ever used a Xerox machine, copy machine, and you've received something that is not original, but a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy? And man, there it, it is messed up. You can hardly read it. That is precedence copying. Sadly, there's a lot of precedence preaching. And sadly, there's a lot of biblical interpretation that is done in the same manner does not take a stretch of the imagination to accept the notion that while the Constitution is clear on what the law says and what it means, it is also as clear that there are vast differences of how these documents are interpreted. 
Well, Rick, you're not a lawyer, so you don't understand. What I do understand, and what I know for a fact, is that these documents of our nation's birth were intentionally written without legalizing. And with these words that everyone could understand them, it's the lawyers that messed it up. You ever read a document that a lawyer wrote? The joke is it takes a Philadelphia lawyer to understand. It's also easy to observe that while the ideal justice is blindfolded, we know from empirical data and from observation and undisputed evidence that there exists a boatload of bias, deception, nepotism, power and control and deception, and it can be legitimately argued that there and we live in a two-tier system. That is what's good for the goose is not always good for the gander. Now, let us turn to our scriptures. Beginning with Romans, the 13th chapter. As Paul is addressing not only a concern of his time, but one of today as well. As I read Romans up to chapter 12, 13 and then from 14 on it looks like that 13's out of place it looks like that uh, Paul had a hiccup that uh, all of a sudden he allowed his mind to wander around a little bit and before he knew it he was off the subject but then he brought himself back into it that is Romans the 13th and there were a lot of questions, a lot of dissension, a lot of misunderstanding about the law and about Christianity and about Judaism and about what should be followed and who is the highest power and who do we really answer to and are we obligated to a earthly government? And if we are, what do we do about God's government? Well, Paul addresses that. And the first seven verses we will begin with in Romans the 13th chapter. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That's our legal system. That's presidents, senators, congressmen. But then... He throws a monkey wrench into that. And he says, For there is no power but of God. So you see, what God does in earthly rulers is that he delegates power. You cannot give ultimate power to someone because it does not belong to them power of the president of our country it's not his power it is a power that has been loaned to him and all other officials to do what according to the scriptures to give God the glory whoops the powers that are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, now we're not talking about worldly government here, now we're talking about God's power. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers now here we go and here can be a real easy side road and a trap that we can fall into thinking that using this verse as the authority to obey everything our government tells us to obey 
but I want to invite you to go to a set of commentaries, liberal or conservative. Go to the Interpreter's Bible, which is kind of liberal, or you can go to the Moody Interpretations commentary, which is ultra-conservative. I have both sets. I looked at both sets. And verse 3 takes a turn. And no longer are we talking about the government, but now we're talking about the synagogue. Remember who Paul's talking to. He's talking to the Jewish Christians, and he's talking to the Orthodox Jews. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister. Here we're going back, and now we're beginning to look. Who's, being, who's Paul's talking about? He's talking about the rabbis and the rulers and the priests of the synagogues and the temples. Go look it up in your commentary. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God. Well, I tell you what, my skin just crawls when I hear people take this verse and they interpret it that if someone is elected into official office that we therefore ought to consider them a minister of God. Are you kidding me? A revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. Yeah, well, that part may be true for worldly government. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for consciousness sake. That is conviction. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, that's the rabbis and the priests, attending continually upon this very thing, bringing to us the law. What law? The law of the Old Testament. But there is also a new law that's now being presented by Paul, and that is the law of the New Testament. Jesus came not to abolish the old law, but what? To fulfill and to make the Old Testament complete. Excuse me for going into a teaching mode, but I think it's important that we, that we know this. Render therefore to all their dues. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about when the rabbi or the priest said, when you come into this temple, that you are to bring a Darius. You are to bring money and you are to give it to the temple and to the priest and to the rabbi and to the synagogue that they therefore might do the work of the Lord render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is dear there needs to be respect custom to whom custom that is the traditions of the Old Testament. Remember the Old Testament. We don't abolish it. It's, a, it's alive and real and functional and relevant as any other religious belief. Fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor. So are we always to obey the government no matter what the circumstances are? There are those who would say yes, who misunderstand these verses, and who maintain that if somebody is a ruler, that they are therefore ordained by God. We find ourselves in a catch-22 situation. Yes, we're to obey the government, but then we read in the book of Acts 5.29 that says we're to obey God first. And always. But then Romans 13 says to 
obey the government. Well, just maybe we have found a contradiction in the Bible. Wouldn't this be just peachy for all of the atheists, the agnostics, and the anti-believers? Well, upon further investigation into the scriptures, we discover a reality that many of these verses have been taken out of context, used for personal agendas, and just plain ignorance. Now you've already picked up on the teaching that Romans 13 has little to do with one's relationship to the government either in the Roman Empire or in our own government today. There were two factions in Roman society where Paul is preaching, where Jesus ministered, where the apostles came from, where the business, the economy, and the politics and the government of the land of Judea was under the rule of the Roman Empire. And there were two factions in this Roman society. First, there were the Herodians. I remember hearing about the Herodians in seventh grade history, and I could not think of anything more boring than to learn about the Herodians in the Roman Empire as we studied the history of, the, of Western civilization. Boy, I wish now I would have listened a little bit closer. Because it was not only important then, but it is more important now. The Herodians, those were those who followed Herod. And who believed that God put Herod and other rulers like him in power and control. And that no matter what he said, did, or thought, that it was a rule that we were to follow. And those that were Herodians did. They maintain that as citizens, we do everything that the bureaucrats legislate. I've heard a lot of people in the last several months worrying about the mental fitness of our president who stands behind a podium and not too sure of where he's going or where he's been. Don't worry about him, please. Don't be sidetracked. It's not him. It's the bureaucrats behind him. In the church, what the Bible says, plain and pure is understandable. It is those that are behind the scenes that are doing the damage to our country and to our church. Those that appear to be in power or simply a diversion, a deception. It's those behind the scenes that are in closed door meetings deciding it's okay. Well, by the way, right now I'm not talking about the government. I'm talking about the church. I meant to tell you that I was getting ready to change gears. In the church, what the Bible says is plain and pure and understandable. It is those behind the scenes in meetings deciding it's okay for the church to approve and save through their own interpretation that certain abominations are not a sin. You've heard me say this many times and I will probably say it once or twice more, but I served a major denomination for over 40 years and I tried as hard as I know how to preach God to preach Jesus and to bring people into the saving grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and never was there a happier day when someone came to me and said preacher I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior that I pray was my ministry 
in that same church in the North Carolina conference this last week, they just approved to ordain a homosexual couple in a civil ceremony and are now influencing every local pastor to marry those who come to them who are whatever. Well, there was a second group beside the Herodians Those were the Pharisees. The Pharisees maintained to obey God in the synagogue as the final authority and, of course, with their interpretations of what the Bible says. I especially like some of the things that they taught, like it says that a woman needs to walk three steps behind a man. Somebody just held up four fingers. <laughs> Lee Brown. I don't even have to look. Honey, let me finish. That's what he thinks. And of that other group in society, that is the Herodians and now the Pharisees of the temple, there are two groups inside the temple. First, those who believe and accepted Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And secondly, those who don't. And you can immediately see the conflict. In Romans 13, Paul is telling both Christians and Jews to obey and respect the synagogue rulers. You see, what was happening here is that the Christians, the new Christians were saying, let's get out of here. These traditional Jews that don't believe in Jesus as Messiah, we need to go off and start our own thing. Well, that's not what Paul is saying here, and that's not what God is saying through the Scriptures. He's saying, yes, you need to understand the Old Testament is fulfillment of the New Testament. And yes, you need to be there for a witness. You know, one of the strongest places that we can witness is not in Africa or China or Cuba. Sometimes the best place that we need to witness is right inside the church. Many of the new Christians just wanted to run off, start their own church, and put aside all of the traditions, the knowledge, and the truth of the Old Testament. You do that, you take away the foundation of the New Testament church. The New Testament church has nothing to stand on unless there is a foundation, and that foundation is the Old Testament. When I've heard preachers, and I have heard preachers say, well, the only thing I'm going to preach is I'm going to preach out of the New Testament. Well, your house is built upon the sand. For our information, as we've already said, paying taxes in verse 6 is referring paying to the temple. So what about us, you and me, in this country of the United States paying our taxes with representation, I might add, to our government? Well, looking at the clock, I do not have time, but I will, I hope when I mention these verses <laughs> that I have pre-typed, or my wife has pre-typed for me, that in uh, Matthew twenty-two fifteen, I'll try to cut something else out to read this. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. The Pharisees were trying to trip Jesus up. They were trying to make it to where he would make a contradiction and to go against the law. The Pharisees, remember who they are in the temple? And entangle him in his talk. And they sent unto him their disciple with the Herodians. 
you got to have everybody in there saying, Master, we know that thou art true. Watch out. When somebody starts loading you up with a lot of compliments, you're getting ready to be opened up and filleted and had for supper. Master, we know thou art true. And we know that thou teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? And now the knife comes out. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. That is, Jesus read their hearts and said, Why tempt me, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he saith unto them, Whose image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar, and unto God the things that are of God's. When they heard these words, they were marveled and left him and went their way. He had to shade them. What a marvelous and insightful truth and teaching. Whose picture's on the coin? Jesus is saying, Give honor and glory and obedience to God for the well-being of society so that we can live together in some harmony. We do give to our government. If there is a stop sign at an intersection, stop and look all three ways. The life you may save may be mine. Then we continue in Romans, and don't have time to read it, but you will later after the sermon. And Romans 13, the 8th through the 14th chapter, it says that we have a responsibility towards society and our fellow man to make every effort to coexist. That doesn't mean co-agree. It means to coexist and that every person may be able to exercise their personal freedom. I cannot coexist with somebody who does not want me to have personal freedom. exercise their personal freedom without prosecution and persecution. The Bible tells us to obey the laws of the land, but there is one exception. Acts 5.22 and 23. Then Peter and the other apostle answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. One exception for not obeying the law of the land is when rulers try to force Christians to go against the will of God. If the government interprets the law to break one of the Ten Commandments or a biblical precept, we do not obey that law. I'm not trying to get anybody to riot, not trying to cause trouble, not trying to get any of you to break the law, hear me, But if the government's paying for abortions, it's wrong. And I need to say something about it. If there wasn't so many chicken preachers out there, you would hear it from every pulpit in the land. When businesses are being forced to bake wedding cakes, cakes for queers, That's what your uncle, Alice, <laughs> Alice uncle is, is not queer. He, I'll tell you that story later. <laughs> but when ministers of the gospel are being pressured to, to marry these perverts, Gotta tell you this story. You know what? We it's five. It's four minutes to eleven, 
uh, you go get a drink of water and go to the bathroom and come back. We'll try to finish it five minutes after. Take your time. Not you here. <laughs> there was a man out in Nevada. Nevada. You say tomato, I'll say tomato. And this man had a business, very successful business, but he decided he wasn't going to pay his taxes. And his tax bill just kept running and running and running up. Did I mention what his business was? He ran the Mustang Ranch, a legalized house of prostitution. Well, the government came in and said, you haven't paid us taxes in 10 years, so therefore we're shutting you down, and you still owe us millions of dollars. That should have been the end of the story, right? Okay. But it wasn't. You know what the government did? They went in and took over the Mustang Ranch. <laughs> Friends, I'm not making this story up. Just go read it. Now, you think the story should be finished, right? <laughs> but it's not. Here's the next part of the story. The government ran it, and guess what? They ran it into debt. <laughs> <laughs> and could not make a business out of prostitutes. How do you, how do you not do that? <laughs> When the government is sponsoring things like that, we need to speak out against it. These apostles remember that many of the apostles, most all of the apostles, were before Paul was converted. He was still off killing Christians were put into jail and they refused to stop preaching Jesus. In verse 29, fifth chapter, Acts, I've already said we ought to obey God rather than men. Remember the COVID panic mandates? The government instructed preachers to shut down their churches. Many even in our own community could not wait to obey. Oh, you could still fill your car up with gas. You could go to Walmart, but you gotta shut your church down. Well, go fly your rainbow flag. We're not closing. I have to confess, we were closed for one week because I was in shock. I, I just... I, thought I was living in the twilight zone. When I went by Lowe's and Walmart and they were open, but I was being told to shut the doors of my church. Well, fooey on that. Friends, we're meeting next week. And we did. And we haven't stopped. Well, I was out for a few weeks on vacation, but other than that. <laughs> but in that one week, I was in shock. I prayed, and my spiritual senses were revived. And the next week, we reop reopened our doors. And I might add that everybody, leadership, and members were back. Remember the preacher in Pennsylvania that we talked about last week? who got arrested for quoting scripture at the gay parade. So when is civil disobedience allowed? If a police off officer stops me from going 70 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, my Christian obligation is to stop, pull over, apologize, and drop my check in the mail or go to driving school. If I steal your car or even your lawnmower, I go to jail. If I participate in looting a store, I go to jail, as I should. These are the laws of the land that protect us, that give us laws that we might have the freedom to worship. 
However, there were times in the scriptures that people disobeyed the government and followed the will of God. Now we can obey God and the government at the same time if the laws are just. But when man's laws contradict God's laws, follow God. In Exodus 1, I'm going to give you three examples and then I'm shutting down, okay? I promise. But i got to give you these examples because they're scriptural. In Exodus, that's the second book of the Bible, the Egyptian Pharaoh was threatened by hearing that there might be a Messiah coming eventually. So this Egyptian Pharaoh ordered every male newborn Jewish boy to be killed. Well, there was a Jewish mother who had a little baby. And she didn't want it killed. So God gave her a trick to get around the law. God's loophole. And she took the baby and took a basket and she waterproofed it with cellophane. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe it was tin foil, I don't know. <laughs> but somehow she waterproofed that basket. And she took her little baby and, and she put it in this basket and she was right there by the palace of the Pharaoh and the River Nile. And she took this basket and she put it in the River Nile and she gently pushed it off. And she said, God speed my son. And they were out in the pool of the palace. Some young maidens. And one of them said, look, what's that basket out there? And they said, let's go see. And they pulled this baby in out of the basket. To make a long story short, this baby ended up becoming the adopted son of the Pharaoh of Egypt. Became an architect, a military leader, a diplomat, a politician that could have had the whole world at his feet. And what did he choose to do? He chose to leave that and go out and wander in the desert for 40 years. His name was Moses. In Joshua, the second chapter, Joshua and Caleb were spies from the Israeli army. And they went into Jericho to do recon. For you civilians, that's reconnaissance and go in and find out the lay of the land and find out where their enemy was and what he was doing and how much they had for armament. And they went in and they got so caught up with putting stuff on their iPad that Time got away from them, and the sun went down, and they began to close the gates of the city of Jericho. And Caleb and Joshua said, oh my gosh, what in the world are we going to do? They find out that we're Jews and that we're spies. They're going to kill us. Well, they had an idea. You self-righteous Christians aren't going to understand this. They went to a house of prostitution and there was a lady, a madam, by the name of Rahab. And she says, come in, I'll take care of you. I know who you are and I know what you're doing. And they went in and because of most houses of prostitution, they were on the outside wall. There's a lot of reasons behind that. Don't have time to go into it, but it's so business people and other people could slip in and out of there without the rest of the people seeing them. Anyway, I digress. So when the sun finally went down and it got dark, she had a rope. She threw the rope out the window, which was right there at the wall. And Caleb and Joshua slid down that rope. He went back to make a report. And by the way, came back with an army and won. They disobeyed the law. In Daniel, there were three men who were instructed to obey the law and to worship the king at the town center. And when they went by to pay homage 
to the king and they said, we ain't doing it. The king said, if you don't do it, I'm going to put you in a furnace to burn up. He said, go ahead, we don't care. <clears throat> well, they refused. They fired up the furnace. The king said, push them in. They did. The king said, didn't we send three men in there? And he said, yeah. Well, they said, I see a fourth one around. They came out of the furnace and there wasn't a hair singed on their body and there wasn't a black spot on their clothes from fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Revelation, when the Antichrist commands all those who are alive during the end times to worship an image of himself, but those few who somehow manage to be Christians will disobey. Is God calling you to take a stand? Hear me, I'm not telling you to break a law, but I'm telling you to follow your godly convictions, not mine. Follow God, follow Jesus, in your community, in your church, in your family, with your friends, and at your work. For the highest law is the law of God. The Lord be with you. for staying with us on this overtimed sermon. Now i got to go home and come up with another one for uh, next week with God's help. And now as Almighty God sits at the throne of heaven through the grace of His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.